Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. Anyway, we hope you enjoyed the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Meldred S., and as many of you in the Erie area know, I am an alcoholic. Our anonymity, like our sobriety, is a treasured possession. We ask the help of all present, especially if there are any persons representing the press or broadcasting media, in protecting the anonymity of all alcoholics present or mentioned here today. Tradition number 11 states as follows. Our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need always maintain personal anonymity at the level of the press, radio, and film. Anne is from Niles, Ohio, and she has 28 years of sobriety behind her and it is with a great deal of pride that I introduce Ann C. of Niles, Ohio. Thank you. It is good to see friends that I haven't seen for quite some time. I'm enjoying today a lot. My purpose here right now, however, is to share my experience with you in the hope that I can be helpful. I am primarily concerned with someone fairly new in the program who might be in the room because those of us who have been in AA for a while know beyond a shadow of a doubt that AA will work as long as we continue to try to live by our principles. But I can remember how full of doubts I was, how full of fears I was when I first sought help from AA. I thought, yes, it might work for all these other people, but I wonder if it'll work for me. I listened to those who had stayed sober. They gave me little bits of advice, and by following the advice of sober people, I am still with you today and have no desire to leave. But so far as these acoustics in here are really bad, you know that, don't you? I'm talking back to myself here. Is it ringing out there? I guess there's nothing can be done about it, so uh, we'll have to practice a little tolerance or something here. So far as my drinking is concerned, Uh, I was living in Akron, Ohio, when AA was born there, but at that time, I never dreamed that I would ever take a drink. I had never associated with drinking people and didn't think that I ever would. The routine in my life at that time was eat, sleep, work, and go to church, mostly go to church. I was teaching Sunday school when I was 16 years old. My dad was a lay minister, and we never associated with people outside of our own church. I didn't know anything about what alcohol could do to people, and yet there was one person I used to see. The first job that I had in my life was in the Second National Building in Akron, and I used to see this man come down there. I knew his name. I knew he was a doctor. He would sit at the lunch counter, but he would never eat. That in itself is a little bit odd, you know, but I used to see him drink bromo seltzers, alka seltzers, tomato juice, you name it, and he had the shakes, and he didn't even smell good, and I used to move away from him, and one day I asked Bill, the owner of the place, uh, tell me something. Does that man have palsy? He shakes all the time. 
And Bill, with a big smile, said he doesn't have palsy. He has a perpetual hangover. I didn't know what the word meant, so I had to have it explained to me. Then I made a classic remark. Well, if that's all it is, why doesn't that crazy man stop drinking? He surely doesn't enjoy shaking like that. I didn't, I'm getting ahead of my story, but after I'd been in AA a couple of months, I went to the largest meeting I'd ever attended, and guess who got up to give a talk? The man whose picture is over here. And I was surprised. I said, what's he doing up there? And they said, well, he's going to give a talk. That's Dr. Bob. And I said, Dr. Bob, you mean the man I've been reading about, the co-founder of AA? I knew him in Akron, and he was a terrible drunk. Well, after the meeting, Dr. Bob said to me, Ann, I often wondered what happened to you. He said, do you know that I stayed away from you? They told me you were a little Sunday school teacher, and I didn't want any more preaching. And I said, well, I stayed away from you for a different reason. You didn't smell exactly like a rose. And he got a kick out of that and told me that day, that evening rather, anytime I was in Akron, feel free to come to his home, come to his office. I took him up on that, and he was of tremendous help to me. Once the problem developed, once I sought help, and he helped me through the difficult period of adjustment to a sober life after being dependent on alcohol for so long. But I was not always dependent on alcohol. I had been married a while before I took my first drink, and I was working in Youngstown for the senior member of a law firm. I belonged to a business women's sorority, and I was the only one in the crowd who didn't drink. They noticed that. And an argument would start every time. Why aren't you drinking? And I'd say, why should I drink? Uh, they said, you'll have a better time. I, I'm having a good time. And on and on this went. And if you try to start an argument with me even today, and neither side is going to give in, I, I'll walk away. I don't like prolonged arguments when there can never be a meeting of the minds. So I decided to end the argument by taking a drink and announcing to one one and all, that I didn't like the stuff, and I thought if they have any manners, they will then leave me alone. As I downed my first drink, I couldn't help but think of the strange behavior of two of the gals in that crowd. One was 19, one was 20, and after a few drinks, anything could happen, and usually did. I won't go into some of the goofy things they did, but I thought the boys in the white coats had missed a couple, and so... There was a little fear connected with that first drink because I thought, what if I misbehave the way those two do if I drink? So down it went, and I waited for some kind of a reaction, and I didn't get any. So the fear went away, and I made a a different decision. I decided not to say a word to these gals. I reasoned a little bit that I would drink with them. Wouldn't hurt me and they'd be happy that I joined their party. This is how I started to drink. Not wanting to, not intending to, but finally taking my first drink and deciding to drink with that particular crowd. For a while, they're the only ones I drank with. Then as time went by, wherever I was, if drinks were being served, I took my share. More time went by. I went through a stage of drinking that some go through, not everybody, because there is such a thing as instant alcoholism. A person can be an alcoholic and not even know it till they take their first drink, and the strange reaction they get indicates there's a problem right there. It was present, but alcohol activated it. So, anyway, with me, I went through a stage where I could drink everybody under the table, big guys, little guys, big gals, little gals. And and my friends used to stand back in amazement and say, I don't see how she can drink all that and she never gets drunk. My behavior did not change for a while. Alcohol did very little for me or to me. I could stop in the middle of the drink. I was not a compulsive drinker. 
and drinking did not interfere with my home life, my social life, my work, or anything else. I, if anyone had told me then that someday I would have an alcoholic problem, that I would get in trouble because of my drinking, I would have argued with them it can't possibly be. And yet, I learned since I've been in AA that the ability to consume large quantities of alcohol without showing its effects is one of the early symptoms of alcoholism. Now, I learn it. Now I learn it. I didn't know anything about it then, but I had no problem as to say for a while. I can look back in retrospect and see where I made my first mistake in drinking. I had worked in Youngstown, lived in Warren. After a bad winter, I decided to work in Warren. I got a job working for the sales manager of an engineering company. Up until that time, I'd always been a legal secretary, and the work was quite interesting. The work I was doing for this sales manager was not interesting. It was boring. And I had an assistant, at least that was her title, and I used to say she sat on the first three letters of her title because my work would be piling up and she'd be doing nothing, looking out the window, uh, daydreaming, writing personal letters. I used to say she was lazy, but in AA you take a different look at people and things, and I don't believe she was well. In fact, she died. She must not have been well. She just didn't feel like working. But that, I didn't know any of this, and I was frustrated, and I built up a big case of resentment against her. I had to work long hours over time to keep up with the work, which she could have helped me with. And my nerves started acting up for the first time in my life. Prior to that, I didn't know what people were talking about if they claimed they were nervous. I didn't like the feeling. I told the ones with whom I worked that I was going back to legal work. It never affected me this way. And life was too short. I felt tied in knots at the end of the day. It would take too long to relax after I got home. They listened. They advised me not to quit my job. They said many days they felt that way, but they had found an answer. They found a way to cope with it. They said that if I would stop in the cocktail lounge on the way home <clears throat> and have a couple of quickies, that means fast, uh, that I could relax in a hurry. For the first time, I, I did follow their advice, and I gulped drinks instead of sipping, and I learned they were right. In a matter of minutes, I could be as relaxed as a kitten, and I loved the feeling. But what I did not know then, and I do know now, is that my dependence on alcohol had already started. From Before that, if you had hidden my bottle, it was not important enough to me for me to even spend time looking for it. From then on, any time I wanted to relax in a hurry, I knew how to do it, and I did it. So the intake was increasing right along, and I was on my way to alcoholism because I was depending on it for relaxation, and as we know, dependence can lead to addiction. During this period, <clears throat> we were forced to move to Arizona because of my husband's health, and while there, I was homesick, I was lonesome, I felt shut off from my Ohio friends. I did not want to be in Arizona, especially where I knew, didn't know anybody. So out there, in order to try to be happy for the time being, I deliberately looked to the bottle for that happiness. I was looking in the wrong place, of course. But any happiness I got was false. It was temporary, but it satisfied me. There were nights if you had blown Ohio off the map, I, was, I didn't care. I thought I was having a ball. But the intake was increasing. My dependence on it was increasing, and very shortly after that, my behavior started to change. My personality started to change. I didn't want to take the blame for any of it. I didn't blame the alcohol. I blamed the warm climate. Your blood gets thin. I blamed art. I blamed people. I blamed things. But I did not blame my drinking for anything that went wrong. 
But I had to start making excuses for bad drinking behavior. This is not necessary with people who have full control. One night, I thought it was a splendid idea to replace a singer in their floor show. I didn't like her look, I didn't like her singing, and I was on my way up there to push her aside and take over. Somebody pulled me back in time, sobered me for a moment, believe me. I thought, what if I had? Then I thought, I better tell these people something so they won't think I'm crazy the way I used to think Becky and Wilma were crazy, so I said on my birthday, isn't it all right to celebrate? And the word got around the room. They were singing a happy birthday to me. I was taking the bounce. Everybody had joined my birthday party. No one was criticizing me for almost crashing the floor show. But that was December. My birthday does happen to be in May. And I have one coming up pretty soon now. But it worked so well as a good excuse for bad drinking behavior that I started having frequent birthdays, maybe two, three a week times. I'm glad I didn't really have that many, but the uh, Phoenix was so spread out, I didn't have to see the same crowd every night, and I'm a go, go, go girl anyway. When I, I want to go where the action is, and if I get bored, I want to go where there's more action, and that was a pattern of my drinking. But enough embarrassing things happened out there, and over and above the things that happened, things were happening to me. At one time, I was an unselfish person. I used to derive a lot of pleasure out of doing for other people. Out there, my wishes and my desires were becoming more important than anybody else's. The alcohol, the time I spent drinking, was taking up more and more of my time. And I blamed the, I thought, well, I'm homesick. That's the reason I drink. And my friends are all in Ohio. That's the reason I drink. And, any excuse will do if it makes you feel justified. But I was becoming selfish, and a selfish person cannot be happy. Honesty had been pounded into our little heads when we were children. I was becoming dishonest. I'm thankful to say that my dishonesty was always involved, tangled up with the bottle. I did not like me when I was dishonest. I don't like dishonest people, and that includes me. One of the greatest reliefs I had when I came in the program was that I don't have to be dishonest anymore. I can revert to being the kind of a person, practicing the kind of honesty that my mother pounded into our heads. But on the, on the long way back from Arizona, I told Art I wasn't going to drink anymore, and he was so pleased because he didn't drink. He didn't associate with drinking people. He couldn't understand how I even took a first drink, and he couldn't understand the change in me. He said, I'm glad you're not going to drink anymore. You're a different person when you drink, Ann, and you're too nice a person. He said, I'm so happy that you are not going to drink. Well, I wasn't thinking of whether he was happy or unhappy. My selfishness was showing again. I was thinking when I left Ohio, they had a farewell party for me. The plot was to get me drunk. It didn't work. The instigator of the plot got very drunk and had to be carried home, put to bed for a while before he could entertain the people coming in that evening. But I was still in that stage where I could drink everybody under the table and continue to function, keep appointments, get home when I should be home and all that. I didn't want those people to see what could happen between the first and the last drink, and I sure didn't know what was going to. So for two thirsty weeks, I turned down all offers of drinks, and then I sold myself a familiar bill of goods. It will be different now. And I picked up my first drink. Pretty soon, I realized every time I drank any amount of alcohol, I wanted more and more and more. I didn't always take more. But it's a strain on the nervous system to want 20 when stop at 2. Believe me, it's easier to stay sober. But I couldn't always stop at 2. I started getting out of control again. I knew nothing about AA. I knew nothing about alcoholism. My husband worked in a place where there were some AA members. 
he talked to one of them about me, and that fellow tried to carry the message to someone who had a closed mind. He was a good friend up until the day he wanted to discuss my drinking, and from then on I didn't like him very much anymore. And I told him he was not welcome at our house if he thought that my drinking was his business. It was mine. And if I wanted to quit, that would be my business. I said, I don't have to play ring around a rosy with a bunch of drunks to stay sober. See, Bill has written in one of his books that defiance is an outstanding characteristic of the alcoholic. And a practicing alcoholic is defiant. And I was one of the most defiant I've ever had to cope with. Once in a while, I run into a close second. But I wanted... At that particular time, a thousand members of AA could not have helped me. The desire for sobriety has to come from the person with the problem. And I did not recognize my problem. It was still people and things, people and things. If she, if he, if they, if this were different, I'd be all right. If I had been courteous enough to even accept the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, and even opened it to the second page. I might have learned something then that could have ended my battle with the bottle, because at that time the doctor's opinion was there. And in it he says that alcoholism is not entirely a matter of mental control. There is a physical factor involved. And any picture of the alcoholic that leaves out the physical factor is incomplete. Had I known that I had changed physically to the point where I could not, my system would not tolerate alcohol without setting up this phenomenon of craving, I don't think it would have been such a bitter pill to swallow because I thought my trouble was all mental. I'm glad to learn it was partly physical, partly mental, partly spiritual. Threefold. But I thought it was every time things got went wrong, I thought it was a temporary situation and next time it would be different. But because I was too proud and too stubborn and too full of do-it-yourselfness, if there is such a word, I suffered longer and caused the heartaches and suffering of people that I dearly loved. The people who are near and dear to us uh, are hurt the most because they care the most. But there is a compensating factor in AA. Those who were hurt the most, if we take AA seriously and try to practice the program, they are made the happiest and benefit the most by our A behavior, which is certainly in contrast to our drinking behavior if we're trying to live the program. So I had four brothers and a sister, and I had friends worrying about me. Uh, only one brother ever said anything to me about my drinking, and I fixed him as soon as he went home. I got plastered because, you know, we try to get even. I wish I could have given them that hangover I had. That would be getting even. But time went by, and my world was getting smaller, the bottle was getting bigger, and people tried to talk to me, and I would say, leave me alone, don't bother me, go away, who needs you? And if they talked to me about my drinking, I crossed them off my list of friends. I was withdrawing into my own little world with bottle, with a bottle for the only company I wanted, really. It, and then... We have peculiar ways of advertising our problem, even though we think nobody knows. We advertise it. At least I did. If you're a prancing drunk, now if you're a closet drunk, maybe you can get away with hiding it. In fact, there are a lot of women, hidden women alcoholics today, if they'd ever come out and be counted, uh, <laughs> boy, uh, membership would double tomorrow. That's for sure. I've, I've taken some of them out of their bedrooms and closets uh, that were protected by the family and the husband and all that for up to a point, and this was only prolonging the agony. In my own case, the agony was prolonged because Art was kind. He was patient, and he never said anything cruel or did anything cruel. 
no matter how much I hurt him. Uh, I'm happy about that. And I will say that I suffered more or less in silence myself, because when I get so sick, I thought I was going to die. I didn't whimper. I didn't ask for room service. I suffered in silence with the attitude, you ask for this, let's see if you can take it. I'm glad because then there are no harsh words uh, that were said one to the other during the time that I was in the throes of alcoholism. But one time, I don't know if I should take time to tell this or not, but it, it goes to show that people nearby not only know about it, but we can advertise it in faraway places. During one of my sober periods, and I did have them, with a mistaken idea that it'll be, you know, after I get it out of my system, I'll be all right. I can start again, not knowing about alcoholism. I got a call from Michigan and asked me to come up there to Ferndale, take care of my uh, sister-in-law's home and family while she went into a sanitarium. I welcomed the chance. They belonged to the same church we did, and I didn't think anybody in that church ever drank anything, anytime, anyplace. So I thought it'll really be out of my system. Then I can come back and start from scratch. Well, I went up there, and the first day I saw a bar with a lot of stuff in it. Boy, I was surprised. And casually that night at dinner, I said that I was surprised to see that you have stuff like that in your home. Does anyone in this house drink? He said, oh, a little, you know, on special occasions. He said, if you ever feel like taking a little nip, help yourself. Wrong thing to say. Wrong thing. I was no longer interested in little nips. I was interested in big gulps and then uh, replace it with water, you know. And I did most of my drinking at night when they'd all gone to bed. But gee whiz, I didn't like to be a lone drinker, right? And one night, they were all in bed, and I didn't want a glass of water. That's about what was in all those bottles. And I knew there would be action at the end of that street in a little bar called Duck Inn. So, how to get there? But I did have difficulty getting home because that bicycle became very unmanageable. There was a guy walking in the same direction, and he must have passed me six or seven times. And he said, Lady... Finally, he said, lady, why don't you walk that thing home? And if I'd been strong enough, he'd had a bicycle right in his face, believe me. I got up anger steam, and that can give you strength, and I got that bicycle home without falling down again. Now, I thought I had a big secret. I'd had a beautiful time, everybody in bed, but people are not as stupid as we wish they were. Three days later, of course, my brother-in-law asked what happened. I had bruises. You may not bruise, but I do. And he said, what happened? I said, I fell down, hoping he would think it was the uh, basement steps, you know, and that he should have gotten them fixed or something. He's still blaming other people. Three days later, they had had a little family conference, and the upshot was, uh, we can get along without you very well. How about that? Fired from a job I wasn't getting paid for. There was a message in there for me, but I didn't get it. I went home angry, resentful, and got drunker than ever in Niles, Ohio, to get even with the people up in Michigan. So I was on my way again, and there were two people in my life that still didn't know what my real problem was. Uh, One was mother. One was dad. Those who knew wouldn't tell. They knew it would break their hearts if they knew what really was wrong with me. I had managed to stay away from Akron. I never took my first drink in Akron. And if I had had a drink, I wouldn't go to Akron for fear someone would see hell. I knew what it would do to Mother and Dad. The secret was kept until the day Mother called. My sister had gone into coma. She said, if you expect to see her alive, you better hurry to Akron, which I did. When I saw her, so Well, she was unconscious, looked more dead than alive. The only thing I could think of that would help me, there's your selfishness again, (coughs) was to have a couple of drinks. It won't seem so bad. The turmoil started. How can I? Mother here. I swore I'd never let her see me if I'd had a drink. 
But the insane idea that a couple of drinks would help is what I held on to. Went downtown telling her I'd be back in an hour. Eight hours later, I was still seeking the relaxation I once could always find in the bottle. It wasn't there. I found drunkenness. I had to go back to the hospital, pick up mother, take her home. Visiting hours were over. Mother was alone in the waiting room. I had to drive her all across Akron. Oh, that was a long distance, and I was trying to inhale all the way. We think if we don't exhale, no one can tell we're drinking. And we got to her house, and she said, uh, don't you think you should stay all night? I said, perhaps I should, and I did. The drinks wore off. The remorse that set in was terrific. It was a long, sleepless night for both of us. From time to time, I could hear Mother sobbing. I didn't sleep. She didn't sleep. I shed some tears of my own that night, believe me. And the next day, Mother said nothing to me. The times after that, we had to be together in the same room. It was painful for both of us. If I glanced her way, I could see the heartache in her face. The occasional tear. But I didn't see her too many times because one day my mother, who was 54, became suddenly ill and died. The doctor was called and she said, Doctor, there's nothing you can do for me. I am dying. I know it. And I'm not afraid to die. So don't worry about that. Then she turned to the rest of the family and said, But Ann was supposed to be here this weekend. Does anyone know where she is? If they had known... They couldn't have told my mother because those were her last words. My brother and my sister, who had survived that illness, waited until after the funeral to tell me what had happened. And when I realized that mother had died worrying about me, instead of worrying about dying, I went into my last stage of drinking where I wanted nothing out of the bottle except oblivion. I could not stand my sober thoughts anymore. I could see what was happening. He came to me and he said, Ann, I don't believe you'll ever quit drinking. I believe that you'll drink until you lose your mind and have to be put away or you'll drink until you die. But he said, I did marry you for better, for worse. I still love you in spite of the fact that you're breaking my heart. And for, But from now on, you can drink all you want, anything you want. Name your poison. I'll bring it to you in any quantity, and I'll drink with you if that's what you want. But he said, there's one condition. Please drink at home so I won't be terrified when you are away and the doorbell or the telephone rings. The last, I don't know how long, the time it was of my drinking, I was a self-made prisoner in my own home. I had a bedroom for a cell, a bottle for a cellmate, and people were shut out. Nothing mattered to me except trying not to think of the long list of people that I had heard. But on April Fool's Day, after a time of knocking myself out as much as possible, I awakened, I poured my morning drink. It would have meant another day of drinking, I am sure. But as I downed that drink, I was weaving in front of a full-length mirror, and I took a look at that stranger in the mirror, and I was so shocked, I fell back on the vanity bench and took a longer look. I put the drink to one side, and I asked me a lot of questions, and I got some answers. And as of the day, they've turned out to be helpful answers. And I believe the reason it happened that way is because that day I voluntarily came out of my dream world where I had been for so long and wanted to look at me as I really was and look at the shambles of my life. And that is the day that I faced me honestly. For the I would quit kidding myself and I didn't know I was practicing some of the honesty that is so essential to day-by-day recovery in this program. I threw out all my excuses for drinking. I quit blaming people and things and took a look at the gal responsible for my predicament. And I thought if there is any hope for me, it has to be an AA because like so many, I had talked 
the clergymen, doctors, etc., 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 and they were being completely honest with them. And they couldn't help me, of course. But that day, I wanted sobriety, and I thought, if AA will let me go, that is my only hope. And I thought they might not let me in the door because I had been ridiculing AA and everybody in it uh, for quite some time, ever since I found out my friend was in AA and he was trying to take my bottle away. I didn't take that drink that I had poured. I'm glad that I was willing to suffer in order to get well. I sometimes get a little provoked, a little impatient, with people who will go to a drying out place. They may stay five days, seven days, ten days, twenty-eight days. Then they come out, and they are physically sober, eating good, maybe not sleeping so good. That doesn't always come right away. Then their hand shakes a little bit, and guess where they go? Right back to the bar room to start the cycle all over again. I knew that it would take time. It took time to get me in the condition I was in, and it was going to take time to get me out of it if I survived. Many of you have heard Jack Darrell in Cleveland talk about the three Ds in AA, the desire for sobriety, the decision to do something about our drinking, and the determination to stay sober at all costs. And I can truthfully say I still have that determination. It's stronger, if anything, than it was then. But my mind said, no matter what comes in your life, it doesn't matter. A drink will never be the answer. If I drink, it will only add to my misery, subtract from my happiness, divide my attention, multiply my troubles. And if you are convinced of that, you're not going to reach for a drink no matter what. And I've had heartaches and sorrow, of course, since I came into the fellowship. Um, the first hurdle was to watch my dad die slowly and painfully. I was the last one with him to <clears throat> spend five days with him. That sister that I told you about, she died uh, at a young age of an illness that keeps marching on, even if they take their medication and do everything the doctor says. I'm glad that I'm an alcoholic. I'm glad I didn't have the illness that she had because there was no answer for it. It was a matter of time. I'm glad that I don't have terminal cancer. I'm glad that I have both legs and both arms. Uh, I have a lot to be grateful for that I finally found out what my problem was and what to do about it. And I found out that I could live without drinking. I had to take it by the hour and... <laughs> A day would be gone and put a check mark on the calendar. Thank God, no drinks a day. It wasn't easy. I walked the floor. I cried. I threw a few things. At that time, I was the only woman member in the Warren group. I went to my first meeting, and there were the wives were there, but no women uh, alcoholics at that meeting. I knew this. I was not only the woman, uh, the only woman member there. I was the youngest to go in there. I don't think they knew what to do with me. I really don't. They looked so bewildered <laughs> when I wandered in. But the, the two wives of the AA members sat on either side of me, giving me comfort, giving me hope. They were kind, and I didn't expect that from them. I really didn't. I loved them for it. And I think the first thing any of us get is a little glimmer of hope. If we see a room full of people, most of whom are staying sober a day at a time the AA way, we can help but be hopeful that we too can follow in their footsteps of sobriety. I was fearful, but the fear did go away. And after the physical hangover left, I went to the older ones in the group, ones who had managed to stay sober for a long time in spite of life problems, and I knew I had some coming up that weren't going to be too easy to cope with, but I was tired running. I wanted to face life. So they gave me little bits of advice, things that were working for them. They said, if you want to stay sober, stay close to those who are trying to do the same thing you are, and you can stay close to them if you will continue to go to AA meetings. I did not know how important that word continue was then, but I believed them. 
And I went to meetings, shake, tears. I had no car. I got there in any kind of weather. They said meetings are important. Go when I went. And later, I uh, had enough confidence to get behind the wheel of a car again. I had lost self-confidence. I had lost so many things because I had been the victim of an illness which I did not understand, but I finally asked for help anyway and then began to understand it. They also said there's lots of literature. It can all be helpful, and it is. Uh, I'm going to look at the literature table today. If there's anything out there that I haven't already read, I want to pick some up because they are good. There is one pamphlet, however, that I picked up in Akron. It was written by a man in Akron, and I haven't yet read it. And Bill Wilson and I <coughs> were on the same program one day, and I had uh, uh, mentioned this. I said, there's one pamphlet I started to read, and I'm not going to read it today, and, and I hope I never read it. And he looked up and said, oh, he thought I was criticizing some of the conference-approved literature. But when I told him why I wasn't going to read it, he, you know, kind of applauded. It's called The Second Reader. And in the first paragraph or so, it says, it's for those for whom the initial enthusiasm for AA has worn off. The glamour is gone. They're bored with AA. And if they continue in that frame of mind, they could very well be drinking. Well, I read that. It's for those for whom the initial enthusiasm for AA was worn off. I thought, well, I only have to read that today. My enthusiasm for AA has continued to grow, and I still haven't felt the need of reading that pamphlet. If I get too busy to still try to help uh, this suffering alcoholic, get too busy to go on a 12-step call, get too busy to go to meetings where my help comes from, at least Part of the help comes from, I better, I better go home and dust off that pamphlet and read it, because I will need what it has to offer. But so far, even, and this has been a while back, I haven't felt the need of reading it. I'm glad that my enthusiasm for AA has not diminished, it has grown. Then they told me to study the big book, and that was a good choice of words. Reading uh, the big book doesn't do a bit of good. If you study it and follow the suggestions in there, you have a chance of day-by-day -day recovery. You know you can start to death reading a cookbook, and you can memorize the big book and still not be recovering if you don't try to practice the principles that have helped people over a period of how many years? 40, 40, 41 years? Maintain sobriety on a daily basis. They have a daily reprieve from alcoholism contingent upon their spiritual condition. And we do grow spiritually in this program. I sat um, and listened to part of the uh, talks about spiritual values. And there are people who come to AA. They have no belief in themselves, in other people, and certainly no conception of a higher power. But if they stay sober and continue to go to meetings, they will hear things, they will see things that you cannot attribute to mere coincidence. It just doesn't work that way. In, in, in my case, why was it that on March the 31st in 1948, the most important thing in my entire life was a drink, another drink? And on April Fool's Day, the last thing I wanted was a drink. Do you think I did that all by myself? I got the strength from my higher power. I had an unhealthy fear of God as I understood him then. That's all gone away in AA. I have a friendly relationship, just like I feel that he's a friend. And I get help from you people and from the God of my understanding. And most people, not all of them, finally come to believe. And it's wonderful to see this transformation. I have seen it in a number of people along the way. In that big book, I was, I read and understood that there were certain things required of me if I expected to have a happy,
sobriety. I don't want a miserable sobriety. If I couldn't get some happiness out of my sobriety, I'd still be looking for it elsewhere. I have found it here. I want to be happy. I want to listen to the voice of experiences all through the big book. I learned that the dangers of self-pity, resentment, jealousy, envy, hurt, pride, dishonesty, selfishness. I'm not guilty of all those, but if I am guilty of them, I better do something about it. I better try to get them down the side, or some can even be eliminated from our lives. So how do you overcome dishonesty? Try to practice honesty. How do you overcome selfishness? Try to practice selfishness, and there will be unselfishness, and there will be a change for the better. And thus it goes. And I read that I had to do something about my temper. It said, if we are to live, we must be free of anger. The grouch and the brainstorm may be the dubious luxury of normal people, but for alcoholics, these things are poison. I had to work on that temper. And I found out it was the little things, that the lights them build up, that would cause the explosion. I finally came to the conclusion it's not worth spending a fortune in emotion on a trifle. And so the flying saucers quit flying around our house. You know, I used to be a thrower. I almost, well, I did one time. I threw a vase. I was going to throw it through the window, but I knew that would cost a lot of money. I took time to think about that, but I threw it on the floor in a fit of temper. It smashed in the smithereens, and that vase had a lot of sentimental value. (laughs) I still wish I hadn't done it, but I had a wild temper that used to scare me. I found out anger, resentment, self-pity, all these things can endanger my sobriety, and if I don't want to drink, I better not let them build up. I was talking to someone Wednesday who was having a temper fit and building up a good case of resentment, and I said, I've heard you make the statement, you will never, never, never drink again, which is a kind of a dangerous statement to make. I said, if you don't do something about that temper of yours, I'm afraid you won't stay sober. He said, I won't drink. Well, I'm sorry to say, today he's drinking. Three days ago. See, people don't believe the voice of experience. I do. And I listen. And resentment is the number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else. And I was guilty of holding resentment for years. If anyone did anything to me or I thought they did or read between the lines, I could hold a grudge for years. And when I read, we must get rid of this resentment or it too can destroy us, uh, I thought what to do about this feeling of wanting to get even with people who've hurt me. And in my search, I read, if we must get even, let's get even with the people who have done us some good. In AA, it can be a full-time job. Occasionally, we have a person who comes into the program and dries up, but he doesn't take a look at his unmanageable life. There's no incentive to change for the better, and he remains as sober whatever he was before at least dry, not mentally sober, and they can be bothersome. If I feel resentment rising even for a split second against a person, I think I'm not to get even with them. They're not trying to help me. I must get even with the people who've done me some good. And I think of Dr. Bob. I mentioned in the beginning how he helped me through that difficult period of learning to stay sober a day at a time. Then later I met Bill. I love Bill. And I, I treasure, I have wonderful memories of him. We've had many chats. His, the books he has written has helped me. All these things have done me some good. Then I think of Bill the Third Man. Some of you here must have known him in Akron. A warm personality, a wonderful man. And then Ethel, whose story is also in the big book, From the Farm to the City. And that's starting with those four people. All I have to do is think about them a little while, and I've got a warm feeling in here, and the thoughts are pleasant, and any unpleasant thought that tried to stay there has to go. And once in a while, for my own peace of mind, I hope you don't mind, I change one word in the serenity prayer. I say, God grant me the serenity to accept the people I cannot change, because I can get in a lather over what someone else is doing 
but it won't change that person. They're the only ones who can change them, just as I am the only one who can change me. I want to live by the principles of AA because I feel that now I'm no longer selfish and I know I'm not dishonest. I have serenity and peace of mind that has carried me through even tragedy. And I usually take time to go briefly through the steps, but I'll shoot myself if I talk more than five minutes longer. The time's about up. You're going to shut me off. Okay. But to show you that the AA way of life teaches you how to cope with any problem that might come along. I used to wonder about people who were sober for years and then tragedy would strike and they lost their sobriety. Well, Art, my Art was a wonderful guy. We were not only husband and wife, we were friends, we were pals. And I used to kind of wonder, what would my reaction be if I lost my Art? Well, now I know what my reaction would be because it happened. Some of you know it and some of you don't. He was a wonderful man. And now back in 1965, he had a stroke. He was in the hospital seven weeks. 68, he went in the hospital with pneumonia. He didn't get out for four and a half months. A team of doctors thought he would not recover. If he lived, he would be a vegetable. But my faith has deepened since I've been in AA. And even at that time, I said, if it's God's will, my art will recover. He will get home. He will get back to work. I don't care what these people say, these doctors. He did recover. He went back to work, and he hadn't missed a day in five years. He hadn't been sick a day. One night, after a beautiful evening together, he came over and he said, maybe I should go to bed. I have to get up earlier than you. And I said, okay. And he grabbed my hand real tight, and he had a few little pet names for me. And one of them was, he said, you little squirt, I love you. And don't you ever forget that. And I said, I love you too, darling. You know that. And up to bed he went, and that was our last conversation. In the middle of the night, I heard a weird sound, thought I was dreaming. Heard it again, I knew it was him, and I turned on the light, and my art was gone. I was trying to beat the life back into him, shake the life back into him, it took the ambulance a long time to get there. They were having troubles, and this was about 3, 4, 3.30 in the morning. I called the police, and they all got there at the same time, and I'm glad they did because it took them all to get my husband, who was a pretty big guy, into the ambulance, and I knew he was beyond help. But you know what I was doing all the way to the hospital in that ambulance? I was saying the part of the prayer. My serenity prayer that applied at that moment. Accept the things you cannot change. Accept the things you cannot change. Over and over, I didn't care what the, the uh, ambulance driver was thinking. I believe that part of the serenity prayer helped to preserve my sanity and enable me to go home, back into the home, make the funeral arrangements, make the necessary phone calls. And really, I only called relatives. And I made one call the inner group telling them why I couldn't be there that day. Now, I must have a lot of friends in A in that area because at the funeral home and at the funeral, people were there from us over 100 miles away. How they learned about it, I'll probably never know from somebody who thought they should know because Art was a great guy and everybody loved him, and me too. And I miss him terribly, but one thing I will not do is sit and feel sorry for myself because self-pity, too, can lead me back to the bottle. It can endanger my sobriety, and I have ways and means of getting rid of self-pity. I can read the newspaper headlines. I don't have to read the articles. See where many were killed in the plane crash. Uh, so many burned up in the fire. So many killed on the highways on the weekend. If I'm able to sit there soberly and read a newspaper, I'm better off than the ones I am reading about. And so far as art was concerned, it even worked there because I would read the obituary column and see where fellows 
died quite young, suddenly, and left a wife, several children. They hadn't they didn't have the years together that Art and I had. So even in tragedy, if you're thinking along the right lines, you can count your blessings. He wanted to go first, and he wanted to go fast. He got his wish, but there is a void in my life, uh, of course. But I knew I had to give time time and make the adjustments. And my art... One time said, Ann, if I do go first, and I probably will because of the difference in our ages and the illnesses I have had, please don't grieve. He said, you know, I'll be better off. And he looked me right in the eye and he said, Ann, I know you will be all right. And if he believed that with all his heart, I believe that I will be all right as long as I stay close to you people, accept your help, continue to try to help those with a similar problem. And I know you've heard these around AA, but by practicing the 12 steps of our recovery program, I have found these 12 rewards, and with this I will close. In AA, I have found hope instead of desperation, faith instead of despair, courage instead of fear, peace of mind instead of confusion, self-respect instead of self-contempt, Self-confidence instead of helplessness. The respect of others instead of their pity and contempt. A clean conscience instead of a sense of guilt. Real friendships instead of loneliness. A clean pattern of life instead of a purposeless existence. The love and understanding of our families instead of their doubts and fears and the freedom of a happy life instead of the bondage of an alcoholic obsession. All through AA, it's all possible. We should be the most grateful people on the face of this earth, and I am convinced that gratitude will continue this miracle of our day-by-day sobriety, the AA variety. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.